Consider first the Kalam cosmological argument. One, the universe began to exist. Two, if the universe began to exist, then the universe has a transcendent cause, which brought the universe into existence. Three, therefore there is a transcendent cause which brought the universe into existence. By the universe, I mean that reality which is studied by contemporary cosmology. That is to say, all contiguous physical reality which currently takes the form of space-time and its contents. Nothing. Targum. The great emptiness. The whole idea of nothing. Now, nothing is an interesting concept, and in order to try and shorten things, I actually discovered this week a video of me in two minutes and 30 seconds talking about it. I figured I couldn't do it that fast on stage, so here you go. When you think about nothing, you have to be a little more careful than you normally are, because in fact, nothing is a physical concept, because it's the absence of something, and something is a physical concept. And what we've learned over the last hundred years is that nothing is much more complicated than we would have imagined otherwise. For example, the simplest kind of nothing is the kind of nothing of the Bible, say the, an infinite empty space, an infinite dark void. Nothing. The empty space. Lao Tzu says that the usefulness of a window is not so much in the frame as in the empty space through which light can be admitted. So Chinese thought has always recognized the powerfulness of the empty. And I will show you this in Chinese paintings, how space is used in a way that we don't use space. Well, that kind of nothing turns out to be full of stuff in a way, or at least much more complicated than you might have imagined, because due to the laws of quantum mechanics and relativity, we now know that empty space is a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence at every moment. And in fact, for that kind of nothing, if you wait long enough, you're guaranteed by the laws of quantum mechanics to produce something. So the difference between empty space with stuff in it and empty space with nothing in it is not that great anymore. In fact, they're different versions of the same thing. We treat nothingness as if it were ineffective, as if it wasn't really important at all. And yet, when we look out at the night and we see all these stars in space, try and imagine what the heavens would look like if there weren't any space. <laughs> then obviously there wouldn't be any stars. So the transition from nothing to something is not so surprising. Now you might say, well, that's not good enough because you have space. Where did the space come from? The Bible. You know, nothing in it, no particles, no radiation, nothing. Now we tend to think of space as nothing. When we talk about the conquest of space, I can give you a confounded little reason for this attempt to reach Mars, and no assurance at all that it will even be successful. There's a little element notice of hostility in that phrase. It's my personal conviction that no one but an idiot would volunteer, and I shall strongly suspect the sanity of anyone who does. But actually, we're talking about the conquest of distance. Space as such, that is to say, whatever it is that lies between the Earth and the Moon and the Earth and the Sun, is considered to be just nothing at all. What is not a component of Western common sense is that nothing is something. Now that may sound a little contradictory, but I think I can explain it. Well, this, a more demanding definition of nothing is no space. But how do we basically begin to think about the difference between something and nothing? I can say, there is a cigar in my right hand and there is no cigar in my left hand. And so we get the idea of is here and isn't or empty here. But behind that, of course, lies the far more obvious contrast of solid and space. But in fact, once you apply the laws of quantum mechanics to gravity itself, then space itself becomes a quantum mechanical variable and fluctuates in and out of existence. And you can literally, by the laws of quantum mechanics, create universes, create spaces and times where there was no space and time before. Furthermore, we know uh, when we investigate the constitution of matter physically that at the atomic level, there's more space in something than there is anything else. 
But to suggest how very powerful and important this nothing at all is, let me point out to you that if you didn't have space, you couldn't have anything solid. To begin with, without space outside the solid, you wouldn't know where the solid's edges were. I mean, you could think that they would all be jammed together in a lump. There are various objections to that. How would you see the edge of the lump and know it was a lump without space around it? For example, you can see me on the camera because you see a background here and all around me and that background shows up my outline. It's, for example, difficult to see a hand unless there is a contrasting background. Were there no background to the hand, the hand itself would vanish. So form, you can see the form of my hand, see? You cannot possibly realize that form except in terms of space. Here, these V's. You say, all right, these are projections. These are outgoings. These are things. But you cannot realize unless you have the V's, the void, the ingoings between them. Most of it is empty, and which led a physicist at the Argonne Lab at the University of Chicago, who had become a little nutty. He was so impressed with the emptiness of matter that he went around in the most enormous padded slippers in case he should fall through the floor. <laughs> so. Nothing is more fertile than empty. But you always have to have a background to see a figure. You just can't do without it. So now you've got no particles, no radiation, no space, no time. That sounds like nothing. But then you might say, well, you know what? You got the laws of physics. In the West, we inherit the idea of law from those ancient conceptions of God. And it is even passed down into science, where we discuss laws of nature. But one recognizes more and more in the sciences that what we call laws of nature are simply observed regularities in the way things behave. Because we now have good reason to believe that even the laws of physics themselves are kind of arbitrary. There may be an infinite number of universes, and in each universe uh, that's being created, the laws of physics are different. And you, in order to observe regularities, you must look at things through something regular. That is to say, you must lay a ruler alongside them, or compare their behavior with the regular behavior of a clock. But clocks and rulers are human inventions. They are regular measures which we use for comparing the rates of change. Say, a clock is a measure of a rate of change. It's quite arbitrary. But we very easily compare our regulation measuring devices with what makes things happen. It's completely random. And the laws themselves come into existence when the universe comes into existence. As if the sun rises because it's six in the morning. Now that's being completely backwards in one's thinking. And we get into the same confusion when we imagine, for example, that money is wealth. Here we have fantastic wealth, you know, and uh, we have the technological possibility of making everybody on earth the enjoyer of an independent income. So there's no pre-existing fundamental law. Anything that can happen does happen. And th therefore you've got no laws, no space, no time, no particles, no radiation. That's a pretty good definition of nothing. That yin, the negative, implies yang, the positive. And since this is missing in our intellects, we are afraid of nothingness. And don't see that nothingness is the womb, is the empty space which generates something. In Mahayana, it's called Tathagata Garbha, the womb of the Buddha. Could mere mathematics create an entire universe? If the universe never had a beginning, that means that the number of past events in the history of the universe is infinite. But the real existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to metaphysical absurdities. Here's another example of the absurdity of an infinite past. Take the planets Jupiter and Saturn Suppose that for every orbit that Saturn completes around the Sun, the uh, planet Jupiter completes two. If Saturn has completed 10 orbits, Jupiter has completed 20. If Saturn has completed a trillion, 
Jupiter has completed two trillion. The longer they orbit, the farther Saturn falls behind. If they continue to orbit forever, they will approach a limit at which Saturn is infinitely far behind Jupiter. But now, turn the story around. Suppose Jupiter and Saturn have been orbiting the Sun from eternity past. Now which one will have completed the most orbits? Fractal patterns seem so familiar because these shapes are omnipresent in nature. Now, uh, considerations such as these do indeed render the notion of an uh, of a infinite series of past, past events counterintuitive. Well, the correct mathematical answer is that the number of their orbits is identical. Yeah, they do render the notion counterintuitive. But that seems absurd. For the longer they orbit, the greater the disparity between them grows. So how does the number of their orbits magically become identical simply by making them orbit from eternity past? But that something is counterintuitive doesn't entail that it's false. The most important characteristic of fractals is their so-called self-similarity. These and many other examples suggest that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. But something is counterintuitive doesn't entail that it couldn't exist. Look at a fern leaf. It is made out of smaller and smaller copies of itself. I mean, we used to think in philosophy that the way the world is had to conform to our intuitions, but the description of reality given by quantum mechanics shows that reality uh, at its most fundamental level ra is, is, is radically counterintuitive. The same is true for Romanesco broccoli. The branching patterns of trees follow this principle, as do the courses of rivers. Lightning spreads into smaller and smaller branches, each sharing the same features as the main bolt. But also man-made structures organize themselves into fractal patterns, without us actually planning them this way. Here is a map of all the roads leading to Rome, and a map of the Internet. What does broccoli have in common with the Big Bang? And what does it have to do with a video game like No Man's Sky or Minecraft? One thing. All are based on simple formulas that create infinite complexity.